Good afternoon, everybody. It gives me great pleasure to welcome you to this uh, panel discussion on ASEAN. ASEAN is one of these very strange organizations in the world. <laughs> on the one hand, mm -hmm. it's remarkably resilient, carries on, unlike the European Union, doesn't break up. We don't have a Brexit. <laughs> <laughs> And our economic growth is still moving along. Yeah. We are going from the sixth largest economy to the fourth largest economy by 2030. So you're looking for good news. Obviously, ASEAN is a place to go to, especially in a world where, as you can tell, as you travel around, it's very hard to find good news. But the surprising thing is that even though ASEAN is in, by all measurements, a miracle, and frankly, if you compare, yeah. especially with other regional organizations, can you imagine the Gulf Cooperation Council functioning like ASEAN? Or the India and Pakistan getting along as well as the ASEAN countries? Can you imagine that kind of world? But that's what ASEAN has done. It's taken the most difficult, most diverse region of planet Earth and has created, frankly, one of the world's most successful regional organizations. But having done that, people still don't understand why is it so successful. So that's why we have this remarkable panel here to address one of the most important questions. What exactly is happening in ASEAN? How does it work? Yeah. Unfortunately, we, this should, this, of course, we should take uh, at least four hours, but we have 45 minutes. <laughs> and so all the participants uh, have agreed that there'll be no scripted speeches that this will be an uh, uh, interactive uh, session. And hopefully, we can try and give you, at the end of the day, some uh, new insights. And if possible, uh, we'll also try and see if we can get questions from the floor. Mm -hmm. I also mentioned that this is being live streamed. So uh, hopefully, there's a big audience out there also listening uh, to it. I'm just going to very briefly mention who the uh, uh, participants are. You'll read their biography, of course, in the forum's booklets. Uh, we're going to, uh, on my left, we're going to go clockwise, uh, is uh, Minister Trong Hoa Bin, the Deputy Prime Minister of uh, Vietnam. Uh, he'll, be, uh, since, uh, so. he'll be speaking in uh, Vietnamese, so please have your uh, um, earphones ready. Uh, <coughs> next to him is uh, Minister Ailanga Hartato, the Coordinating Minister for Economic Affairs of Indonesia. Thank you very much for coming here. And uh, of course, then we have Ms. Mm. Elianti Hillman, the founder and chairperson of Javara. Uh, uh, she's also a Schwab Foundation social innovator. And last but not least, uh, we have the group chief executive officer and co-founder of Grab uh, from Singapore. So we have this remarkable panel. And I'm going to start by asking mm. the deputy prime minister because, as you know, Vietnam is the right. chairman of ASEAN this year. What, what will Vietnam's be, uh, key right. goals be as chairman in 2020? Oh. I, don't know, says I would like to um, thank the initiative of the uh, Web uh, Davos for hosting this uh, event to introduce about ASEAN and the perspectives of the development in ASEAN. So I would like to respond to the questions as follows. Vietnam is one of the 10 countries in the ASEAN community. That is an organization which has the uh, long history of develop development. Vietnam has uh, participated in this organization in a responsible manner. And at the moment, Vietnam is a country which had the very rapid uh, growth rate. Over the past 10 years, we've been able to maintain a growth rate of uh, over 6%. And uh, over the past two years, this, we have been able to attain 7% of GDP, GDP growth rate. So it is among the highest uh, growth in the world, and it has contributed to the uh, development of ASEAN. We hope that uh, ASEAN development will be stronger and stronger. For ASEAN, I think that is a strategic priority of Vietnam in our foreign policy. 
we have uh, chosen the team for this year cohesive and responsive. That is a very important team that with the goal uh, to contribute uh, to the overall development of ASEAN for the prosperity of ASEAN and uh, to uh, share the uh, common responsibility uh, to connect ASEAN development with other regions in the world and to make an active contribution uh, to the international commitment uh, in order to preserve uh, peace and stability. Thank you. Yeah, it's cohesive and responsive. Mm. Well, that's, I would say, a good, a good mm. thing to, to have yeah. as a goal. Uh, let me turn now to Minister mm. Tato. And I was going to begin by paying a tribute to Indonesia, OK? And I mean this quite sincerely, because I worked in ASEAN for 33 years. And I always say that one key reason why ASEAN has been exceptionally successful has been because its largest member, Indonesia, has been generous to the smaller members and allow them to take the lead in uh, ASEAN. And just, just if you want to know the contrast, uh, mm. the reason why other regional organizations, like the Organization of American States, why it fails is because the largest member tries to dominate. Yeah. Indonesia hasn't done that. And Indonesia has allowed the smaller countries to take the lead. But at the same time, there is also now within Indonesia some voices that are skeptical of uh, ASEAN and saying ASEAN is constraining Indonesia. So what would, how would you describe the current thinking of President Widodo towards ASEAN? How would you characterize it? I think one of the key that keep the ASEAN uh, like what it is today is that Indonesia mm. believes uh, that ASEAN is part of the regional trade organization that defend multilateralism as a belief to enlarge the trade and investment. Yeah. Mm. By creating that, uh, it has proven in the last 20 years, mm. post-crisis, uh, that ASEAN is becoming one of the most growing mm. economy in the world, above the global mm. world uh, average. Mm -hmm. And the key for ASEAN is ASEAN believe in harmony and consensus. There is no footing in ASEAN, within an ASEAN. Mm -hmm. So we go together. Though there will be yeah. a challenge, a challenge on the additional regional trade that what has been mm -hmm. discussed mm -hmm. in Bangkok about mm -hmm. RCEPs. Mm -hmm. RCEPs actually is already done, mm -hmm. but the one that is still holding is India. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. So whether the ASEAN, for the very first time, mm. uh, it is never in ASEAN mm. that making decision based not on consensus. Mm. But this time is the challenge whether we can go on consensus that go RCEP without mm. one country. Mm -hmm. Because RCEP is comprised of 29% mm. of the whole uh, trade and 47% of the whole population. Yeah. Now, even with, without India, uh, yeah. it's already 27%, and uh, also it's bigger than any trading bloc, mm. EU, even TPP-11. Mm. So that's the first challenge. The second challenge is that the ASEAN actually, <laughs> the intra-trade ASEAN is not as per expected. Mm. So we can grow more intra-trade within mm. the ASEAN, because most of the ASEAN countries produce, export, almost similar product, mm. namely manufacturing, electronics, automotive, textile, mm. and internally we can mm. compete each other mm. for the exporting countries. Yeah. Mm. Well, I must say you pointed out to two big challenges on RCEP and the uh, India's decision not to participate. But you know, ASEAN has all this wonderful formula called ASEAN minus X. Right. So sometimes it all, not all 10 countries can agree, mm -hmm. eight go first. Right. <laughs> so similarly, we now have our set minus one. <laughs> the only thing that ASEAN has mm. formula is that the minus is with schedule <laughs> on different years. That's right. <laughs> That's right. Hopefully India uh, uh, will join uh, 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 later on. But you know, on intra-ASEAN trade, you're right to say 
that intra-ASEAN state has, trade has been relatively stable. Right. But you know, but the total trade of ASEAN has been going up. Right. And therefore, the intra-ASEAN trade in percentage terms is stable, but in absolute terms is going it's up. Growing up. So mm -hmm. we, do, we, do, we are improving in that dimension right. too. Right. So now I'm going to turn from trade and uh, to the question. <laughs> so about so the I, ASEAN like a I would like to say that ASEAN is very responsive. ASEAN is very much responsive, especially in the fourth industrial revolution. The opportunity for ASEAN to increase its inner capacity is great. That, you know, it's good to have this uh, interjections, but do alert us so we can put our... So, you know, one of the major criticisms that's been made of ASEAN, mm -hmm. this is a long-standing criticism, is that it has been a project of the governments of ASEAN and not the people uh, of ASEAN. Uh, hence, the people of ASEAN you mm. say, don't feel the same sense of ownership of ASEAN that the people of Europe do, you know? So mm. the question is, and this is to you, especially as a social innovator, how do you think we can get the people of ASEAN to feel a greater sense of ownership of ASEAN? Um, I think it's very interesting. Um, actually, the connection is there. Um. We do have the connection, except that our connection might be invisible from the ASEAN governance. Mm. So I'm taking examples of the social entrepreneurship network mm. and the woman entrepreneurship network. Mm. We support each other. It's mm. just amazing what we have done for each other. And probably um, it's different from the normal businesses because we tend, even when we compete mm -hmm. against each other for the exporting countries, but at the same time, we promote each other, we help each other. And mm. I think- So you're different from the men. <laughs> <laughs> Sorry to say. But, Good example. Um, but, no, I'm, I'm touching not only women, but also social entrepreneurs yeah. and social innovators. So I think it's very important there is a common denomination yes. based on values, yeah. based on impact targets mm. that are beyond the country. So if mm. we're talking about poverty, everybody are facing poverty. Mm. When we are talking about malnutrition, everybody is talking about malnutrition. Mm. And this common denomination is actually the one that's connecting us mm. together, except that a lot of times our connection is invisible. Mm. from the governance. So um, we do much more thing than what is being recognized uh, mm. by the governance of the ASEAN. Mm. Can you just quickly give one or two examples of how you collaborate with others? So social, uh, for uh, example, uh, one of the critical uh, factor is innovations, yeah. right? Because that's how we help the farmers to move to the next level. Yeah. And um, for example, the, the solar dome dryer that I have is actually helped by the, uh, by the Thai. Mm. So it's the Thailand uh, professor who developed the solar dome dryer, came to us and helped our uh, Rural Entrepreneur Academy mm. and setting up our solar dome dryer. So it's basically it's people to people. Mm. You know, it's not G2G, it's people to people. Mm. And because they felt like have responsibility to support the farmers regardless mm. which part of ASEAN they are yeah. from. Um, and then another thing is that because, you know, it's been a challenge for us, for example, how to penetrate the export countries. Mm. And then apparently our common friends who are doing exactly the same with what you said, exactly the same products. It's like, Heli, do you know how to get in? I'll let, I'll let you know how to do it. Mm. And it's because they believe we are sharing the same mission. Mm -hmm. And that's what connects us. Good. That's a good, very good example. So, Anthony. I'm going to ask you the most difficult question. Oh, wonderful. <laughs> I'm ready. Uh, you know, obviously, we live in uh, a mm. different world. Uh, everything is digitized. Mm. What, what do you see the role of the digital economy in ASEAN's transformation and economic development? And how do you think the, mm. the tech industry can help ASEAN industries, what they call 4.0 goals? Well, number one, I think tech is, uh, we should never paint tech with just a broad brush. I think mm. that's number one, um, because we're, we're quite different. So take, for example, uh, Grab. It's a tech platform company, right? mm. uh, mostly uh, O2O, mm. so online to offline. So we serve, for example, today, uh, 9.7 million micro-entrepreneurs. Mm. Uh, many, many people in Indonesia, many, many people in Vietnam. Uh, and again, thanks to the ministers here who supported mm. us to build that. Uh, with these 9.7 million micro-entrepreneurs, we've been able to develop and contribute 
5.8 billion US dollars of GDP just last year alone to Southeast Asia. So again, uh, we, we meaning, we meaning uh, Grab's platform, yeah. empowering. You know, we, we always say we don't give uh, fish to the you know the the those that are less blessed than us, right? Yeah. Um, the drivers, the yeah. the food merchants, the the person who serves a bobo ayam, you know, uh, chicken porridge or fur at the side of the street. We provide tools and we empower them yeah. uh, to to generate more. Uh, to generate, to become a micro-entrepreneur. Right? Mm. So with that, uh, we, uh, together with this, this panel here, developed you know, $5.8 billion of GDP. Um, but I think more importantly, if you go down to that one story we talked about just now, uh, Ibu City, right? The ability where companies like Grab, and there are many uh, across Southeast Asia, can work hand in hand with governments like the Indonesian government, Vietnamese government, to create policies uh, that help people. So specifically, one, one person, uh, Ibu Siti, she's uh, completely handicapped. Um, and the old policy was that handicapped people, disabled people, uh, uh, especially disabled women, are not allowed to drive and pick up passengers and earn an income. <coughs> so she had no income. Uh, thanks to working very close with governments, we are able to now turn that around. And today, she, her husband, not only is she and her husband driving and earning income, uh, her husband now has developed a, a business to create uh, disabled car kits for other uh, disabled people to become a grab car driver. Mm. So this has created one win-win. The government wins by creating mm. employment, creating income for the bottom of the mm. pyramid. Two, people like Citi uh, now has an income that she never had before. Mm. Three, companies like Grab, we're very blessed because we have more supply in a supply-constrained environment. So customers are happier because there's more cars, there's more motorbikes, there's more uh, modes of transport. So I think here's where I think technology platform companies can work hand in hand with governments mm. to create tremendous GDP contribution throughout the region. Yeah, just a quick follow up question. One of the comments about ASEAN is that the paradox about ASEAN is that the businesses are successful within ASEAN. And ASEAN in theory has created a, some kind of uh, common market or whatever it is. But in practice, when companies deal with ASEAN governments, mm. they have to deal with 10 different governments, 10 different regulations. And of course, we have things like ASEAN single window and all that. But how far have we gone mm. in terms of creating a, like, what I would call a common operating business platform? I mean, we, we, you can, how candid can you be <laughs> without uh, upsetting any government? <laughs> <laughs> oh, you put me on the spot. Uh, <laughs> so we operate in 339 cities across Southeast Asia. <laughs> Uh, so, you know, I, as a fellow person from ASEAN, born in ASEAN, grown up in ASEAN, serving ASEAN citizens, uh, we still haven't figured it out. Uh, it's, it's, it's non... It's complicated. You know, it's extremely complicated, right? Even, uh, you know, they will say, even in Indonesia, uh, serving a customer in, uh, in Jakarta, uh, you know, of Javanese descent, is going to be different from serving a Chinese customer in Medan. Right, yeah. uh, and a Balinese customer is different. Uh, same thing with in, in serving, you know, Ho Chi Minh versus a Hanoi customer. Mm. Um, you know, they have different price points, they have mm. different preferences. So I think it's not about working with a country government. Uh, of course, the ministers here are very helpful, but also working with a local government. Right, we have to work with the 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 Balinese governor. We also have to work with. Uh, Medanese uh, and Jabodetabek and right, Jakarta. Um, mm. So it's it's not just a one size fits all. Mm. Good. I'm going to ask a follow up question to you, Minister mm. Tato. But before that, I want to also alert the audience. Uh, I cannot cannot see some of you behind me. <laughs> that uh, I'm going to throw the floor open for for questions, and uh, I hope you will. Uh, I hope there are mics or something that are available that uh, you can uh, you can join the discussion and and post questions if you would like to. You know. So, uh, Minister Hato, you've just heard what Anthony said. You know, as you know, I've attended, as I said, lots of ASEAN meetings, 
we make all kinds of commitments. We want to have an ASEAN single window, facilitate trade and all that. How do we make that more real for the business? What's your view as a policymaker? First uh, is the uh, uh, tax issues or fiscal mm -hmm. issues. Uh, that, tax. Uh, yeah, tax and fiscal. Now with national single windows, is we talk about automatic exchange of information. We start with that information flow. Mm. Second, of course, uh, if we talk about digital, then we have to agree on uh, commodities, on product, on the value of the product that are open, uh, not subject to custom mm -hmm. uh, exercise. Otherwise, there will be no market without this uh, mm. uh, custom check in every product and commodities. That's one of the steps that we have mm. to go through. But uh, I think we haven't integrated on the investment license processes mm. because uh, each operate on different scheme, including different kind of incentive. Mm. But towards the one market, there is a challenge also. Mm. If the market between intra-trade ASEAN, mm. other countries, probably the trade is much more than the others. That's right. There is always a case mm. that uh, the other countries asking mm. uh, more or uh, balance trade between the ASEAN. Yeah. So I think that the, the trend toward that kind of things also happening. Mm. So I think uh, and each of ASEAN countries having different risk profile. Mm. That's why the investment, the, the interest mm. is different. We are not towards the European countries toward one single currency That's right. because we know that with that kind of arrangement there is a lot of things to lose than mm. uh, using the ASEAN models. Yeah. So I was going to ask you, DPM, if you don't mind, what, what is your view about this trade uh, facilitation? You know, because I know Vietnam is also trying very hard to you know, participate in the digital economy too. So how, how do you think Vietnam as chairman of ASEAN can enhance the, the, degree, the increase in trade facilitation? Among the ASEAN countries. Our perspective on uh, driving trade among ASEAN states is that we need to have a policy and legal institution that is transparent and open, uh, thereby creating a, an equal playground for all businesses and people in but in their participation in uh, uh, business within ASEAN. Uh, we also need to have uh, an open and uh, comfortable procedures, administrative procedures. And thirdly, we need to attract uh, resources from uh, within our countries, but also open the door for businesses from external, uh, externally to uh, conduct business. This would allow us to develop but, and also to be responsible to the ASEAN, ASEAN community. We focus on the sense of community and the identity of ASEAN. And uh, as um, Mr. Minister has mentioned, we have 10 nations. And despite our differences, the existing mechanisms are being ever more connected. Uh, even our parliamentaries, parliaments are connected, governments are connected, uh, legal agencies are connected. And thereby creating a general consensus within ASEAN to respond to this new period of integration. Uh, so I'm now going to throw the uh, floor open. Yes, we have one and two. So let's take two questions together. And if you don't mind, just briefly introduce yourself and pose mm. a short, sharp question. <laughs> sure, uh, sure, thank you for that. Uh, my name is Don Lam, I'm from Vietnam. Uh, just to follow up on your point regarding the ASEAN is more of a government push rather than the people push. Yeah. Um, we've been talking about that for a long time because mm. a lot of the time people don't feel like they be part of ASEAN. You know, there, there's no ASEAN identity like in the EU. Um, but mm. I, think, I think things have, have gone a long way uh, since the last five years, I believe, uh, with a number of things. One is that 
with the air flight connecting among the ASEAN uh, country becoming more available through this county airline, I think that mm. when people travel between countries, they get closer when they understand each other's culture. Mm. Uh, the other thing is when you have the, you know, in ASEAN, they're crazy about soccer, right? So when there's an ASEAN soccer cup, people get together. But I think mm. uh, the government should do more to encourage. Uh, mm. There's no systematic ways of, of creating an ASEAN identity. So I'm wondering if there is a way among the panelists, is there any other suggestion that you can do, what you can do to create an ASEAN identity? Excellent, excellent question. So can I just pass the microphone? Again, if you don't mind, briefly introduce yourself okay. a short, sharp question. Okay. Thank you. I'm Hayashi from Japan. Uh, I'm part of the Global Shipyard Community. Um, and I do entrepreneurship of education for senior uh, citizens in Japan. Um, and you're from Japan? I'm from Japan, yeah. Okay, yeah. Um, but I personally studied in Singapore, by the way. Um, <laughs> and my question is um, the something so-called gig economy. So um, you mentioned micro-entrepreneurs, and I, I love the way you see it. And also, however, if you um, change the perspective, um, there, might, uh, there are opinions that says um, uh, the gig economy is uh, putting people on a uh, more fragile state where they, it's, it's harder for them to get out of their current um, economic state. So I, um, it's a question to um, all of you. Um, is, do you think the gig so-called gig, gig economy is contributing um, to the stability of the ASEAN economy? Great. So I think I'll, the second question, I'll pass it to you, Anthony. Sure. But for, I must say, Don made some very interesting points about uh, ways and means of generating people ownership. One is, of course, the explosion in budget travel mm. that, of course, the government's allowed it to happen. And second, of course, the idea maybe of ASEAN hosting, uh, combining together to host the World Cup of football. What do you think? Yeah, I think Mr. one of the idea is <laughs> hosting uh, <laughs> games together. Then we can be... Sports is a great integrator. Sports is gro a great integrator. Mm. And the second is, of course, the student exchange. Huh. So the student as exchange within ASEAN. I think mm. we have to do more for that. Mm -hmm. The third, of course, the digital economy. Mm. Because the digital economy provides opportunities for many people to trade within an ASEAN. Without uh, that kind of things, it's very hard for each ASEAN member mm -hmm. to feel it's part of the ASEAN because mm -hmm. there is still part, the Indonesian still will part of Indonesian, Malaysian is mm -hmm. part of the Malaysian yeah. because they live because of the Malaysian or because of the Indian, mm. Indonesia. But if they can trade apart from the big companies, but mm. for the individual, mm. small and medium yeah. enterprise, mm. then we can create mm. an ASEAN opportunities. They, they feel that mm. they can wow. live with ASEAN network. Mm. Wow. I think that's the homework of yeah. Yeah. The ASEAN okay, uh, uh, please put mm. on your headset, uh, <laughs> <laughs> the DPM, and then I'll turn to you, Harry Anti, before I go. Uh, let's follow up uh, the uh, opinion from the ministers. I would like to raise uh, the initiative uh, from uh, ASEAN. Now Vietnam is the chance of ASEAN. We need to, we would like to um, enhance the identity and community awareness of ASEAN. Uh, and we work on um, uh, ASEAN citizenship and uh, ASEAN community. Ten ASEAN countries, but uh, the cultures are very similar to each other, and the people are very could be sympathetic with each other. And we are visa-free countries, and people could travel freely within uh, ASEAN countries. Uh, but, for example, Mr. Tan, your grab has, uh, has been uh, present in Vietnam. Many other um, businesses also from Thailand, from Malaysia are present in Vietnam. And Vietnam are promoting our businesses to invest abroad. So we need to create uh, this common awareness identity of ASEAN. We need to uh, build um, a platform for ASEAN uh, citizens uh, of ASEAN. But my generation, we learn French, we learn Russian. However, today uh, we have a common language that is English that we could uh, freely communicate with each other in an easy manner. The last point is a mm. very important point mm. because uh, um, 
you know, if you look at the European Union, uh, they have 28 yeah. countries, and when they meet, they translate the meetings into 17 languages, if I'm correct, you know. <laughs> ASEAN, you only speak in one language, English, <laughs> which is quite, an, it's, it's an external language that ASEAN uses. <laughs> That's a paradox of uh, ASEAN. So what, what's your comment, Heli, about uh, Don's mm. question about the people-to-people um, I think we got there. People are looking at, you know, frankly, the, the, at the end of the day, it's actually very important to create this sense of ownership of ASEAN among the people. Yeah, uh, I already give examples on the network of the women entrepreneurship and social entrepreneurship, but I think it's also important to see there is a business leadership that builds the ASEAN identity. Mm. So I'm taking an example of Air Asia, for example. Mm. It's just amazing how they serve the whole ASEAN, not only in terms of selling you know, uh, mm. cheap airline tickets, but the fact that they do have policy to give priority to women-led organization in the indigenous community and disabled mm. in terms of the procurement. And mm. they give a very good uh, you know, uh, services, they, have a, they give a very good rates, so they even go to the rural areas of Indonesia, for example, to provide capacity building for the farmers and then connecting it to their market. So it's just amazing how the business leadership actually can take more uh, because with the scale that they do, actually they can you know, scale up building the you know, ASEAN identity and the sense of you know, uh, ownership. But there is a common denomination that has to be there. It's beyond business. Mm. Because if mm. we're only talking about business, then everybody's talking about their own profits. But when mm. they start to think about beyond the business, about the humanity that they serve, then basically we can go much way ahead with the ASEAN uh, identity. Mm. You know, Tony Fernandez oh. is going to love you a lot. <laughs> 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 the CEO of Asia, yes, is, the yes, best yes. advertisement he's ever got. <laughs> Anthony, <laughs> uh, what's your, your response to the Japanese young man's question? Oh. On gig economy, yeah, uh, workers specifically, I I would say um, they are. What is their next best alternative, right? Um, so I think if you look at uh, many uh, in Vietnam, Indonesia, Philippines, uh, I remember you know there was one one driver I spoke to in Jakarta. Uh, he was a, a parking jockey before, so it, last time, if you remember, uh, a few years ago, uh, they had to have people jump in into a, a car to, to be able to access uh, the highway, for example, uh, so that they have three in one. Um, this guy then now owed money to two different loan shops. Today, as a grab bike driver, he now has his own bike. He now owns a second bike he's renting out to somebody else. Uh, he now is building his own house and is saving up for his own chicken farm, right? And, and I remember the day when we uh, loaned him a phone and we gave him uh, this phone and he, he, he never even switched on a smartphone before. He's only had feature phone before. And today he knows how to use a smartphone. He knows how to rent. He knows how to uh, develop. Uh, he now picks up food, picks up passengers, he picks up e-commerce and delivers it to customers. So I think that is a good example of creating self-entrepreneurship. Now, uh, our next role is then how do you up-level these people? Now, at a macro, this is a one example. Now, if you take it at a macro level, um, I think the, the beauty of companies like Grab and many other examples across uh, the world in this region so rewind eight years ago, I remember when people talk about raising, you know, 50 million or 100 million uh, in startups, in tech startups, people say, are you crazy? Uh, today, uh, we, you know, if you look at it, we raised 100 million. Then we took, you know, money from, uh, or we raised 250 million from Masayoshi. We took uh, money from Japan and we deployed it to millions of people in Vietnam and Indonesia. And these are, you know, the bottom, right? they could never have access capital before. Today, they can access, then we raised a um, billion dollars. Again, we take it, we deployed it uh, to all these people. Usually, if you think about it, you know, rich people, they take the money, they put it in a, a compounding interest. Today, you give it to the bottom of the pyramid, they are growing it, they're spending it, they're developing it, they're upskilling. I think that's the power of the ability to capture capital uh, use human capital and convert it and enable millions. Right? That, I think, is the power of the gig economy. Mm. 
I, you know, we have about 10 minutes left. Does anyone have any quick pressing questions? Yes, let's see, gentlemen. Okay, sorry. One over, yeah, who's, who's that? A lady over here and a gentleman over there. Mm -hmm. Quick questions, so we have 10 minutes left. Yeah. Hi, I'm Again, Maui. identify yourself, yes, yes. Hi, I'm Maui, I'm an impact investor from the Philippines. I'm just wondering about uh, what, how we're going to address in ASEAN the two pressing questions, upskilling and disaster risk reduction. Uh, upskilling and disaster reduction. Uh, risk reduction. Yeah. Please, can you pass the microphone there quickly? Yeah? Thanks. Maybe let me build on that question. My name's Paul Hunyor, uh, based in Singapore. Um, I think we've heard, uh, Anthony, you just mentioned the, the huge changes from feature phone to smartphone. And in many ways in ASEAN, technology has allowed leapfrogging to occur. Um, we've seen this from cash-based societies going to quite smart banking techniques. Uh, one of the other big themes of this Davos is around climate. Uh, and the need to accelerate change. That's very difficult as we're raising people from bottom of the pyramid, but what opportunities exist in ASEAN to also leapfrog when it comes to these other measurements of, of progress? Mm, well, I think we've had three different uh, issues, upskilling, disaster, uh, risk reduction, climate change. I wonder who would like to, Minister Hartato. Yes. What is Indonesia doing on climate change? I think Indonesia uh, is already and will be the champion of, for instance, carbon credit. Hmm. We are working on regulatory framework that we can be on the forefront of this, uh, namely on the forest industry, secondly on the coral and for the man mango trees. And we are working for the prototyping or lighthouse for this carbon credit scheme. At the moment, carbon credit is not really that transparent. And each company deal with uh, other institutions. And the price of carbon is non-standard. So I think in the next one to five years, we are trying to work on this mechanism. Because mm. Indonesia is becoming, can be becoming one of the highest carbon market mm. within the region. And I think there is not much country can do this. And one of the things that we can learn is from the trade of, for instance, for CPOs, for palm oil, mm. which uh, under the pressure of EU that they would like to quote unquote not to buy biofuel from Indonesia. We create our own market. Then the current, our own market can create a better price for the 14 million of farber. So this is the same things that we will do for our sustainable developments in the mm. environments, including uh, how to plant more trees, how to make a research for more main, uh, for more uh, uh, for more. Uh, Mangrove, we make a uh, research for mangrove as well as uh, limiting the the usage of or the trade mm. uh, of uh, these uh, coral trees mm. that we we are basically we ban export for this mm. kind of things. I think the key point is that I think most of the ASEAN countries agree that climate change is a challenge yeah. that has to be right. dealt with. I mean, as you know, we had a world leader say. This morning, he doesn't agree with the prophets of doom right. <laughs> on climate change. I think ASEAN does, <laughs> believes that climate change is real and has to be uh, tackled. Yeah. I wonder when you touched the question, Heli, on upskilling. Uh, so, yeah, I was going to uh, address on that. So, actually, there's also um, there's an up, uh, there is a skill up and there is a skill out. The way we do things is actually it doesn't have to skill up, but you can do skill out through replication by sharing your lessons learned, best practices, and do cross-learning with other uh, entrepreneurs. And that's what we have been doing in the ASEAN regions uh, with mm. the Women Entrepreneurs Network, with the Social Entrepreneurs Network. So mm. basically, yes, you can you know, scale up the impact, but mm. through scaling out, through mm. replication, through cross-licensing, through cross-learning. So that's also a different way of uh, touching it up. Mm. Do you want to add something, D DPM, on this, on upscaling, on Regarding uh, 
capacity building, uh, we deem this as a national priority and one of the three main strategic breakthroughs. Uh, with the other two being in, in infrastructure and institution, creating a, a, an open and transparent playground for people and businesses to approach uh, advanced business models and technologies. And the third one is obviously technology uh, breakthroughs. We have sent our, our officials abroad to cross-learn, and this is a mechanism that I believe that ASEAN can uh, consider to together train a workforce in service of the uh, um, unique features of the ASEAN co economy. Regarding the issue of climate change, it is our perspective that disasters can either be uh, uh, because of nature or because of the people. It, and in this case, it's because of the overexploitation of natural resources or environmental destruction that eventually lead to climate change right now. We can't, of course, uh, fight against nature. We have to cope with it. When disasters happen, we need to uh, figure out the origin. We need So we need to now replant the forest, especially those that can, uh, and we have to fight against uh, those who destroy forest and those who overexploit uh, natural resources. So we need to synchronize between rebuilding, re rebuilding the environment and uh, combating environmental destruction. And we also need to uh, maintain protection forest. This is uh, featured among our policy, and I believe that this should also be taken into consideration by other ASEAN member states. Because obviously, forest fire is also um, a very large uh, a catastrophe that we need to face. Do you want to put in just a quick one-liner on uh, the, the, the last question about climate change and... And upskilling. Yeah. Sure. Um, very think, quickly, Anthony. Sure. I think one is uh, EV ecosystem. So we've, uh, w with, with uh, both governments, uh, Indonesia and Vietnam, we're investing, uh, you know, hundreds of millions into electric vehicle ecosystem. So we had the largest uh, EV fleet in Singapore. We've learned that we built, uh, together with SP Power, we built thousands of uh, e EV charging stations. Now we're working and deploying that in, um, again, learning and, and growing together, uh, deploying that in Indonesia and in Vietnam. Again, I think the best way to fight climate change is uh, a lot of it is uh, pollution from cars. So we're going to remove that with EVs. You know, behind you, you see this figure of 50 years, right? Mm -hmm. The World Economic Forum was created in 1971. In 1971, was also when I attended my first ASEAN meeting. And I can tell you when I attended my first ASEAN meeting of just five ASEAN countries, when I walk into the room, there was tremendous distrust and suspicion among the five countries. We had just come out of Confrontasi, separation of Malaysia and Singapore, problems within Thailand and Malaysia, problems within Philippines and Malaysia. And if you had told me 50 years ago that this region, Southeast Asia, 50 years later would end up having, frankly, either the second or the most successful regional organization in the world where remarkably there's a lot of harmony, cohesiveness uh, among the countries. And of course, there's a lot of imperfections yeah, within ASEAN. Yeah. But at the end of the day, yeah. if you want to feel confident or optimistic about any region in the world, the one region you can feel optimistic and confident about is ASEAN. And I think the reasons why have been elaborated very well by, by our four wonderful panelists, so all are, all that remains for me to do is to thank all four of you for your contributions and for explaining ASEAN to the world. Thank you very much. Thank you. Thank you. Yeah.